you know, yeah. figured out pretty good. Vice Mayor Payne, Second. Council Member Hewer, Council Member Campion, Here. Council Member Powers, Here. Mayor Cruz. Here. You can use this. Under Government Code Section 54954.3, Members of the public may address the council on any agenda item before or during consideration of the item. Speakers shall restrict their comments to a maximum of five minutes. Please fill out a speaker sheet located on the table inside the entrances to the council chambers and forward the completed speaker sheet to the city clerk. Okay, we'll move on to departmental and requests. The recommendation is to provide direction to staff regarding the amount of funding for the city committees and commissions for fiscal year ending 2016. On April 30th, 2015, staff contacted the chairperson and the staff representative of each committee commission regarding the funding opportunity. Staff received the following responses. Commission on Aging for $1,780. Galt Youth Commission. 2,770. The beautific Beautification Committee currently have sufficient funds in the Public Safety Committee. No response was received. The proposals are attached to the staff report along with the uh, Committee Commission Matrix. Any questions or discussion from Council? No. So moved. Second. To, to approve, approve both requests as uh, provided in the staff report. Okay. Vice Mayor Payne, Aye. Council Member Hewer, Aye. Council Member Campion, Aye. Council Member Powers, Aye. Mayor Cruz. Aye. We do have Mr. Gordon in the audience. I don't know, did you want to speak or did you want to have the kids come up here? If you have a moment, yes. Okay. Thank you for allowing us to have a couple moments of your time to uh, you know, present our budget. We're going over disasters, and I thought maybe we could, you know, uh, pitch on in terms of to tell you what some of our needs are, you know, as we've outlined in our proposal. But we're really looking to make the commission even stronger this year, as you can see with some of the training needs and development. Skill building that I'm looking to see what we can do. Um, so I did bring up with one of our commissioners, and we have two other uh, new commissioners, and some of them are in high school, so I really couldn't grab them all. But I did bring two uh, with me as well. I kind of want to speak a little bit about the importance of, of, a, of a need in light of a new logo, which we have seen uh, the need for, for apparel. So as, as we're striving to create a brand for ourselves um, this upcoming year and take more pride in the Gauntlet Commission, we believe it is very necessary to obtain this apparel uh, with our brand on it. If one of you are the prices of the apparel we are hoping to have this upcoming year, this apparel will give the youth leaders more confidence as we have our meetings, make presentations, and serve the community. 
One example of branded apparel is the Galt FSA. Uh, we see this all around with their, their professional dress and their shirts and, and their, um, their coats. And we would like to have this sort of standard as Galt Youth Commission. So um, we believe as being branded would take it to a higher standard and make it more professional and it would give us um, more opportunity to have more confidence in the Galt Youth Commission. Do you have any questions about it? I think it's a good program you have outlined for the training especially, uh, mm -hmm. Toastmasters and so forth. I think that's really good. I think that we were so quick in granting you the money, let you realize that you guys are doing a very good job. And uh, we am glad that you're going to get some recognition with your shirts around town because you're a great group of kids and some great mentors, and you're doing a fabulous job. You really are. If I can just add something, too. Uh, of course, we are very proud of our youth, but I have to say uh, the mentors, that we have this year are putting their whole heart to what they're doing. And I, as an individual, appreciate it, and I'm sure that I'm going to be able to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The recommended action is to review the funding request applications and make, uh, make funding determinations. Um, this year, the staff prepared application process advertised in the two local newspapers. Place the application on the city's website and on social media. The city received three applications which are attached to your staff report from IRS 501c3 nonprofit organizations and they met the requirements of the policy. The three we received, Galt Area Historical Society are asking for $10,000. Project Love is asking for $10,000 and Real Life Church of Galt asking for $7,500. Also attached to the staff report is the Community Benefit Funding Grant Policy in the matrix of the applications received. Thank you. No, I think uh, I did get in a little bit of trouble last year because we didn't have the, uh, the uh, people that were applying to come up and speak, so I think that would probably be the first part of the business. <coughs> It's been a long time since I've been here, but it's nice to be back. I cannot tell you enough how grateful we are for all the support that we've had. Wherever I have been, it has always been nice to be able to say, we go to our city, they listen, and they help. And people look at us like, they do? How amazing. Because apparently, most city councils don't listen. You folks do. Thank you for doing so. We are working very hard to keep the McFarland Ranch as self-sufficient financially as we can make it. We haven't quite reached it, but we're almost there. The big thing is to have the necessary facilities that are necessary to, to accommodate the people who come. We've discovered very quickly that we needed another restroom. And so this is why we're asking for additional funds at this point, because we definitely have to add the extra restrooms closer to the areas where the activities occur. People, well, you saw how long it took me to get from there to here. Those of us who are older cannot go a half a block down to the John if we need to go. And that was what was happening for the seniors who visit, and they love to come, and especially who are in weddings, the, the mothers and the grandmothers and the great-grandmothers and so on, had to go such a distance to get to the restrooms. This was a problem. We also have little children who play, 
And that's more important than thinking about the fact that maybe you should head into the bathroom because it's a distance. So we are trying to make it a little more convenient so less problems occur or don't occur. And that's our request for the money for the restrooms. Whatever you can do to help us, we thank you. And on just a personal note, this will probably be my last personal visit here. <laughs> I came very close to making my last breath of air on Earth <laughs> long ago. And I know I'm going to have to make some decisions to stop doing certain things. And I want to personally thank the city for all that it has done, for the partnership that I have felt as the founder of the Historical Society. The fact that you care enough to want to preserve the history of our society. May I take just a moment to share a little something? When I was first called, a lady called me, she was crying. She said, it, it was raining outside, and she said, oh, Mrs. Olson, I just don't know what to do. They're tearing down the old Harvey house, and you know it was built with stones that they actually brought from Scotland. I said, yes, I know that. Well, they're tearing it all down, and I just found in the street a letter addressed to Dr. Harvey from Lincoln advisor, Stewart. And she said, I took it and I'm going to keep it and I'm going to give it to my children and my children's children are going to have it because this is part of the history as well and we have no place to preserve it. And that's what gave me the idea to create the Historical Society. When we met, what we did was start with four. I asked three very important people in this community, Orville Fletcher, Dr. Greer's wife, Margaret, and the PTA president, uh, Beatrice Hyenga, or who lived on the Oro Ranch, which is now McFarland Ranch, and I asked them to come together with me and, and, and see if they were interested. They were. They, in turn, and I agreed we'd come back again, each of us with five people. And then those five were going to go out and get five and so on, and we grew to where we are now. The important thing is that all through that growing, we had the support of the city. And we became the arm, the historic arm, if you will, of the city council. We loved that role. We love it still. And don't ever ever let anything go between us. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we, we all want to say, Jean, that uh, we have always looked forward to you when you come to the council meetings. And I heard what you say, but I just think we come back again. I'm sure there'll be a cause that we can't overlook. And I don't want to keep you up long. I know you need to sit down and get some rest. I was wondering if there was anyone with you that has an idea about how close we are to meeting the cost of the rest restroom. I don't think you like to get some more Briefly, the whole thing would cost 24500 What we are asking for is the 10000 so that we can do the cement of the building. We do have some other income. The other expenses, the hardware is going to cost 5000 The fixtures are 8000 And then to paint the inside and the outside, once we're done, will cost 1500 So hopefully we can, as Jeannie has said, we will accept and be happy with whatever you can give our way. So this will just get started. Right. But we have other things that we can keep it going, and we're doing fundraisers. So, right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we want you to go.
to the council, thank you for uh, letting me address you today. First of all, I apologize for my address. I'm actually headed to our after school program. Uh, currently, it's one of our requests um, is again for support this year after school program. Uh, we have 200 uh, plus unique visitors this year for our program. Uh, I would consider it, and uh, not in any kind of bragging way, but the folks that do the work at our community center, the phenomenal job serving the kids of the city. Again, it is a free program that includes a homework club, mentoring, a music academy. Uh, we do sports programs. We have an individual that teaches uh, video and uh, graphic production work. Um, we're having a big talent show tonight. We're just having a blast with the kids. We absolutely love the kids of the city. Uh, a couple other areas that we focus on, again, you'll hear from Project Love in a minute. Uh, we work in partnership with them. We house the food pantry uh, last month. I believe it's just under 300 families uniquely out of that. <coughs> uh, we continue to host a multitude of community classes, everything from programs uh, helping people manage uh, issues through uh, grieving the loss of a loved one to community classes. We've had classes for Galt Youth Baseball this year. Uh, again, I'm really asking, again, just for the support for the continuing work that we do. We also host social events. Uh, we just had a big fun uh, art show and auction and community event, uh, probably almost 200 folks there again just to support the kids of the community. And uh, I really love the work that we're doing. I want to continue to do that. Your resources make it available to do so. Uh, one of the things that we did make a change from this year to last year, if you notice, you guys did support us and we're very grateful for that, for the History Makers Foundation. An effort for efficiency and its cost, it's, uh, obviously you run a business here, so it's tough to run two, so we're consulting everything that we do on the live church. Uh, we will be closing the History Makers Foundation as of July 1st, paperwork has been submitted to the government to do so. Uh, we just manage one set of books, one set of efforts, uh, and it's much easier to do so. So everything we're doing for the community is exactly the same. Again, we're going to partner with Project Love for the Big Back to School Bash that's uh, in August. Last year we served, this is my favorite event here, honestly, uh, 307 kids received uh, a haircut, a full set of clothes, new shoes, uh, backpacks with school supplies, and everybody got a meal. It was a phenomenal day. Uh, working with Project Love, we're expecting uh, to serve over 500 families this summer, uh, early in August. So again, any support you can give us, I'm just super grateful for it. Uh, whether or not you do, I'm going to continue to serve the city we love, especially the young people. We are making a difference, and we will continue to do so. Thank you for your consideration. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Project Love. Thank you. So, my name is Dennis Linden, I'm one of the directors of Project Love, and we serve about 350 homeless every month, and we get all our donations from Walmart, we get all their food from the supplies. The main supplies we have to buy ourselves right out of the pocket, which is bags, and food when we serve, we serve a dinner too, afterwards we're writing barbecue for the people that don't have it. And uh, I also volunteer for history makers. <laughs> I'm supposed to be barbecuing right now, but anyway, that's outside. We just need some help. That's all, that's all I can say. Thank you. Can you have any idea how many people we serve? How many people we serve? For the, for the barbecue afterwards? About, there's probably about 200, anywhere from 150 to 200 people. We don't turn anybody away, mm -hmm. put it like that. Uh, if they're destitute, even if they're not homeless, they're uh, mm -hmm. elderly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And where, where do you where do you serve the? Is this up at the? Uh, right outside the church in real life. Real life. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. That's what I'm supposed to do right now. Barbecue and chicken for the one of the last meals of the uh, history makers. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Discussion. Recommendations. Well, I, I think that, you know, all, obviously all of the uh, 
efforts uh, and proposals are, are worthwhile. I um, I have a, a very close affection for the, for the historical society, um, and I know what that need is, and I know that historically that they have um, stepped up to the plate with uh, uh, matching fundraising and, and matching funds for uh, projects that they undertake. Um, I know that uh, Project Love has also done very well uh, based on uh, their past history. Um, I, I, I'm not uh, familiar with the after school program run by the Real Life Church and apparently it would be brand new or a continuation of the, of the other society. Um, I would be, well, I'll leave it at that for right now. Robert. Well, I would, uh, you know, these are the hard choices that we have to make up here. Every, uh, every one of you that have spoken uh, are fulfilling the need for the community. And as a city, those are some of the needs that we can't uh, fulfill on our own without your help and the volunteers that work with you. Uh, I'm hoping that we can give some support uh, to all three of you. You've come and you've asked for support and you meet the criteria of, of, com of helping the community and continuing to help the community. Um, so it would be my hope that we can do something for all three of, of you that have applied. Uh, I do have a question, uh, James. Uh, you said that you're, uh, you're, it, it currently runs through History Makers, but you're going to dissolve it in June, and then you're going to bring it back up in September. Is this a year-round um, program, or do you just do it during some, the summer? Because so if you're going to start it in September... Yeah, we can pick up right after uh, the after-school bash early in August. So we run it through August. Uh, we have two more weeks, so August through June. We skip about seven to eight weeks of the summer. And I'm sorry, I should have asked this while you were up here. Um, is, is the transition going to be easy? I mean, you, you're going to have to go from being the history makers to something else. Do you have to redo articles of incorporation or anything? I've uh, we do. Uh, we're in the process of doing that. We've got some folks volunteers on the work creation and new materials. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm sorry. I need you to come back up here. No. I'm sorry. That was. It's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Is it okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. That works. Sure. And um, we're in the process of rebranding all that. And it'll be called Real Life Kids. Uh, it'll be the exact same uh, crew again. It's just from my standpoint for efficiency and business matters. We're going to install it under Real Life Church. So nothing changes. Okay. Thank you. Cops over here. Have any questions? No. Okay. Do I have any recommendations? I would move that we give seven thousand to the historical society and uh, fifteen hundred to each of the other two. I'll second that. Work for me. Okay. A motion by Vice Mayor Payne and a second by Councilmember Campion. Any further motions? Call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Payne? Aye. Council Member Hewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Powers? Aye. Mayor Cruz? Aye. Okay. Uh, moving on to approval of revised salary schedule for part time and temporary positions, effective January 1st of 2016. Paula. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. So before you is um, the revised salary schedule for part-time and temporary employees. As you may remember, we um, were mandated by the State of California for two minimum wage increases. The first one took place July 1, 2014, raising the minimum wage to $9 per hour. At that time, the city um, just raised and changed the salary ranges for the positions that were below minimum wage. Nothing else was affected. So now we're going, we're getting ready for our second increase to $10, which will be effective January 1, 2016. 
and um, in working with the city manager and the department heads, we reviewed um, the positions that would be impacted, and we noticed that there are positions that, because of um, the increases that did not take place to, after the $9 increase, there's compaction. So what's before you tonight is not only the mandated increase to $10, but also a few other positions that will be affected um, if you ac accept the proposal tonight because we, we realized that there were um, positions that might be the one and the two that would be making very close to the same range, um, salary, excuse me, and I feel that um, right with this proposal there will be enough separation between the positions and um, I know it's a little early since it doesn't go into effect until July 1, 2016, but as it says in the staff report, these proposed changes are in the budget um, proposal which you'll be reviewing a little bit later. Are there any questions that you have that I can answer? I would just ask if um, the ones that are being proposed uh, to have an increase to avoid compaction. Do you have any idea how their salaries compare to other cities? And I know it's early because other cities may have to consider the same thing mm -hmm. that we're doing, but at this time, uh, how do they compare? Well, we don't include part-time temporaries in our salary, you know, surveys, but I did do a kind of a quick survey of um, recreation and lifeguard positions in the Sacramento area and we're just like right in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. We're not way above and we're not way below. So, I mean, it's not a you know, scientific survey, but it was, you know, everything in this area. And um, we were, you know, and I used the old um, salary and the new salary, so I, I think we would, it's, you know, competitive. And could you refresh my memory on how much money total we're looking at with this proposal? This increase would be approximately $50,000. And that's just for the compaction issue or also for the $10 an hour minimum? That is for minimum. everything. Everything. Okay. I just want to say it just irritates me that the state is uh, dictating to the city of Gulf that we, we have to do this. Just throw that out there. <laughs> My question is uh, more along the lines in, in, in looking uh, at the internal comparisons, and I don't have you know job descriptions, but the temporary part-time workers for uh, park and public works. I think that isn't there a fairly significant difference in in the hourly rates there? Well, when we talk about public works part-time and temporary positions, right. um, those are usually, um, we use usually the GPSU position because it's a higher skilled position, so yeah, that would be, um, it, it wouldn't be included in this part. Right. Yeah. But, but my point is, um, is there, I mean, is it, because they're, they're temporary and part-time, so I'm guessing, um, and I don't know for a fact, but it would appear to me that if there's a fairly significant difference in, 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 in the hourly rate, that you're probably going to have a lot of internal movement from parks workers to public works record workers. I mean, is that, is that the case at all? Well, I think that's always going to be the case because those do pay a higher amount. These, the park positions that we have here are really the basic entry level positions and well, they, yeah yeah because you're, you're you'd be paying college interns more than a, than your part-time worker mm -hmm. I mean an, an internship and that didn't seem it doesn't seem right to me that a, a you know a college intern or high school intern would make at or more than what your quote full-time temporary part-time employee is well I guess that would depend on what the internship is if it's an engineering intern um, someone that brings skills to the position so I mean, oh, yeah, because you have two levels. You have mm -hmm. intern one, intern two. Um, I, I would like to see, a, I, I would like to look at both the parks workers and the public works uh, temporary part time and look at the job descriptions. I'd like to also take a look at that just to see, you know, what those comparisons are. Maybe can you bring forward a report on that? Because I, I think, I think that, uh, and, and again, I get a lot of this. I've, I've talked to people uh, around town and there's a lot of turnover, it seems like, with the parks workers, more so than with any other part-time workers, such as public works. 
Well, that's hard to say because we have a lot of turnover in our market positions. Okay. Most of our entry level temporary positions, we do have a fair amount of turnover, but then on the other hand, you know, we have some very long term temporary and part time employees. So, um, you know, I think that both, you know, the entry level positions, especially when we're doing the, um, you know, doing the janitorial work or doing your basic, you know, cleaning the bathrooms and cleaning up the market, we, we do have turnover. We don't really have a lot of Public Works temporary part-time employees. We have a couple of um, waste, I don't even know what the positions are, people that work out of the wastewater treatment plant mm -hmm. um, and the water plant. Um, on the Public Works side, do we have any temporary part-time streets workers right now? No, I don't think we, we don't. do. So we don't really employ a lot of temporary part-time Public Works employees. Most of them are, are parks employees um, or recreation workers. Are, are these the, the temporary, are these positions that are limited to the 960 hours or do we go ahead and pay PERS if they go past that? Yeah, There's we limit it. We, we've made a clear distinction between temporary and, and part-time and temporary should not exceed more than 940 hours in a year. Part-time are positions that are approved by council that have a set number of hours. They do go into PERS. We do offer them okay. um, a small contribution to benefits and they also reach um, earn PTO. They're the more consistent needed year-round positions would be part-time. So the classification here, part-time temporary classifications, you could have a parks worker one that is both one part-time and one temporary? We could. Oh, I see. So one would be pretty much a full-time. Right. There may be a need that throughout the year there's a consistent 24 hours a week that it's needed, but then, you know, as summer, gets busier, then we would hire more temporary um, positions that would not go over the 940 and would be just for projects or just on a seasonal basis. And we do monitor that they don't go into PERS. Excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, that's okay. No, but it would seem to me that uh, there should almost be a distinction between your part-time and your temporary to the extent that if you're trying to retain somebody, that if it's a temporary position that you would have uh, a, a higher rate of pay than what the same person is who is only part-time? Well, I think what we try to do is pay based on responsibility and Understand. duties and what they're doing. And, and I mean, when we looked at it before, we felt like they were working at the same level. And the way we enhanced it was by offering the PTO going into PERS and that sort of thing. So that's really the benefit or the advantage of being a part-time worker because you get more consistent hours and, and you know, paid time off. A lot of times the part-timers too have the ability to move up in the range. You know, we've got the five steps. So most right. of the temporary employees are coming in to, at the very bottom and they may work for a year or two at the most and they're moving on to something else. The part-timers can work their way through the full five steps and also make their way up from the uh, park worker one to a park worker two. So there's some, some advancement opportunities there that may not be there on the temporary position. Pretty much. I mean, what's a, what's a typical age of, is there a typical age? I'm just curious. Are we talking high school kids or college kids mostly? What? They're usually, um, they're older than 18 usually in the park. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, early 20s, I would guess. Okay. I mean, I mean we're not, obviously, um, with these wages, you, you're not going to support a family. No. No. I mean, there's no possible way. We have one person that's quite a bit older, but it's a supplement, you know, so, yeah, yeah you're not going to. Most of the workers are um, lifeguards, it's a big chunk of them. They work at our after school programs, our ACES mm -hmm. program, our SOAR program. Right. So uh, we also have employees that work out at the market doing various tasks. So those are the, the bulk of the employees in those categories are doing those positions. And what's the title? Is it recreation worker? Is that a, a, a fleet, is that a market employee or what? It's kind of a generic term. It's, um, yeah, entry level market and it's also um, the Rec Worker 2 is our SOARS program. So in the job description it talks about the different areas that they, they could work in. So um, yeah, Rec Worker is usually, as again, as I said, at the market or at SOARS. Okay. Any further questions? If not, do have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Councilman Review. Do I have a second? <coughs> and we'll second the motion. 
call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Payne? I'm sorry, did we see seconded the motion? Okay. Aye. Council Member Viewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Powers? Aye. Mayor Cruz? Aye. Carries final. All right, moving on to the recommended 2014, 2015, and 2015, 2016 budgets. Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. It's my privilege to present the revised budget for 2014-15 and 2015-16 for your consideration. I wanted to recognize uh, staff sitting in the audience today and around the dais that uh, the hard work that they put into not only putting this budget together, but delivering the, service, the services that the community benefits from on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm always impressed by the commitment of our staff to, the, to this community. The hard work, the customer service, the things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. I think sometimes we, we forget how, how blessed we are and lucky we are that, uh, that we do have such dedicated staff that uh, really do care an awful lot about this community. And so I want to recognize them. and. The budget is always a lot of work for staff in addition to their other jobs that they do. They take time out during the spring to do these things. Now this is a, a midterm budget and I always say it's supposed to be easier but it seems like it never is easier. Uh, this year was particularly I think a lot of work for the finance department because we were implementing the new salary schedules associated with the recent negotiations that we did this, this last year. So Matt Boring and, and people who worked with him did a lot of work putting together the, the new tables and getting all that stuff right. So uh, my, my, my hat's off to them and the work that they did. So without further ado, um, go ahead and, and start in. I'm not going to try to bore you or belabor the different issues. I will try to focus on the highlights. The council, um, this is again amendments or revisions to the budget that you adopted last year. So our goal is to present to you the changes. Uh, new recommendations, there are some new programs or new things in here that you'll see, as well as us just adjusting to changing circumstances that have happened throughout the year. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. <laughs> blinking. Advance for me. Too far. All right. You might just have to advance for me. Let's see. Yeah, it's not working. Okay. So, first, uh, just an, an overview. We always talk about general fund as being the most important fund for the city. It's our discretionary revenue that we have to use for any program or services that the city council sees fit funds uh, our, most of our police department, most of our general operations in the city, and so that's one, one also that is subject to fluctuations in the economy more than any of our other funds, and so we rely on that, and that is what cities look to when they look for fiscal sustainability or when they look to things like bankruptcy, it's the general health and welfare of the general fund. And so we're always very cautious and guarded and making sure that that is healthy and we have healthy reserves to rely on in the case that we have uh, financial turmoil in the future. Good news is the general fund looks a little bit better than it did last year when we presented this budget to the city council. Um, part of last year's budget, we anticipated a general fund balance of about $5.6 million. Uh, we anticipate now that we're going to finish with about $6.1 million. A lot of that is from prior year um, revenues and other things. Some of it's deferred projects and other things, but generally speaking, um, it's certainly uh, positive. For next year, we're anticipating that general fund estimated fund balance will be uh, about $6.1 million. And last year, when we did the budget, we thought it was going to be about 5.7, so that's about an increase of a little less than $400,000. You can see between those two numbers, 6.15 at the end of this year, 6.16 at the end of next year, that tells us that we have a very minor surplus in next fiscal year of about $12,000, which isn't a lot of money, but at least it's on the positive side. It's been the first year we've had in a number of years where we've had more money coming in than going out. Some of those revenues 
unfortunately are some one-time revenues, and so we're using some, some of those revenues for one-time expenses that'll go through with you guys in a minute as far as vehicles and some of those deferred maintenance things we need to catch up on. But overall, um, it's, it's positive news, and it's similar to news, the news that we shared with you last year, which is year two of the budget, 15-16, we expected to have a small surplus. We're still maintaining a small surplus, even though that surplus is actually a little bit smaller than what we originally projected. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next Jason, slide. Jason, do we take part of that and put it into reserve, any percentage of that of yes. surplus? Well, we have a reserve policy mm -hmm. that uh, dictates a certain amount that goes for different different purposes. Um, right now, the, 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 the surplus or the reserve amount is 20% of general fund operating and, and fund six operating expenditures, and that's about $3 million. The other amount above that is extra amount that's considered undesignated. We're going to be coming back to you sometime in the next several months with an internal service fund policy that it will put money aside and dedicate a portion of those, of those reserves for equipment and technology and other kinds of replacement. The city has not done enough in previous years about putting money aside for those types of things. And so we just budget for them on, on an annual basis. When, when we have money, then we put money aside to do that. But we don't have a policy and we don't have a, a systematic way of funding those items. And so what we should be doing and what we will be doing is when we buy a new vehicle, for example, then every year we put money aside so that in the end, end of life of that vehicle, whether it's five years or seven years or three years, that there's money in the budget to replace that. And same goes with other types of things, whether it's an artificial turf out at Walker Park or other types of things that we purchase or buy or build, that when those, those things have a useful life that ends, there's money sitting there. And so a big chunk of that money will go towards that internal service fund when we bring that back to you, to you later. So I can't tell you that we have a lot of extra money sitting in reserves. I can tell you that we, we have enough set aside for our, our economic uncertainty fund that's there, the three million, extra $3 million, the additional $3 million that we have will nowhere near be enough to fund that internal service fund, likely be closer to $10 million of what we need to set aside, um, but it'll be a start. It'll be something that we can, we can start working towards, and so my recommendation to the council would be continue to, to, to set money aside as much as you can. We haven't been able to set any money aside in, in year, many years, and we've taken money out of the reserve. We had about $9 million in, in our reserve when the recession started. So we're about $3 million less than we were several years ago. And so the fear is if we don't build it back up that when the next recession hits, well, instead of starting with nine, we're going to start with six. And six is much closer to zero. And so we need to, to continue to work towards building that, uh, that reserve back up. Thank you. So let's take a look through our revenues on the general fund side, some of the significant increases in the re that result in the, the, the slightly better economic condition of the city. The uh, revenue increases in the current year, about $646,000, and next year about $762,000. And that is made up largely of property tax. You can see property tax is about uh, $225,000 and $300,000 over the next two years. And that's more than what we thought just a year ago. So that means that can property tax Property assessments continue to go up. We're continuing to build new homes, so that feeds into that number. Sales tax is an interesting thing. The current year, we're anticipating it to be flat, stable. Our estimate, we think, is still pretty good, pretty close. So we're not proposing to, to change that. Next year, it is proposed to go up by $247,000, and that is a result, result of an accounting change that's going to allow us to capture an additional two months of sales tax next year. Again, I mentioned one-time revenue. That's a one-time revenue. Next year after that, we're just going to go back to our normal 12 months of sales tax. So next year, we have 14 months of sales tax we're going to be collecting. And so that is some additional money we can put to some one-time purchases. We have some additional money coming in from residual. This is extra money that's not needed for the wind down of the redevelopment agency. That's in the amount of $25,000 this year, an estimated $85,000 next year. Increase in building permit fees. We all know we're seeing new home building, also commercial growth, commercial development. Those result in increased building permit fees, uh, about $100,000 increase this year, and then $86,000 next year. And then interest rates, not going up very quickly, but they're a little bit better than what we thought. And these, this is a number of recommendation from our city treasurer, Sean Farrell. So um, he's, he's very conservative, but he feels like we can expect a little bit of an increase. 
next year, or this year and next year, and $6,9500. Go ahead and on to the next slide. Anybody have questions? You yeah, can feel free to interrupt yeah, me as we go along. On the Walmart revenues, as a percentage, how, how far off were the estimates? Finance, yeah, you guys. I'm just curious. Ballpark. I'm not going to bring that up, but I know that we don't want to consider the actual amount of sales tax that's generated from Walmart, but just as a total percentage, do you have that information on what it is? Uh, our deferred estimate is about, our, our, our current estimate is about 78% of what was originally Which, estimated. Okay. okay. That's for next year or this year or both? Both. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this slide? We'll go ahead and go on to the next one. A few more revenue items, Mr. Winkler. Uh, the, the state of California, in its vast wisdom, chose to give us some additional money for some public safety services, which we appreciate, according to our chief and lieutenants. The word is from Sacramento is we should not expect that that additional revenue. Normally, we, we, the last several years, we've got about $100,000. This is for some of the, the trickle down, that money that they, they gave us to help deal with all the prisoners that they released into our community, that they gave us about $100,000 to help deal with that, follow up with probation and parole and all those kinds of things. And, and so last year, they gave us an extra $40,000 to do that. We don't expect them that to continue in the future. So we still think they'll have the, the additional or the 100000 but not the 140. dollars But that was a one-time increase. And then cost reimbursement. We have several projects that generate additional revenue, uh, Eastview, Wilton Rancheria, to name a few, Royal Delta Inn. Some of those will be, even though there's expenses, that they, we, get re, we will get reimbursed through either court proceedings as a result of the Royal Delta Inn or the reimbursement from the development of those other two projects which I mentioned. So those increase of about 135 in the current year and 44,900. So some of the, you'll see a cost increase on the other side of the ledger on, for some of these projects, but it's offset by the additional revenue. Okay, so expenditure highlights on the general fund. A couple of major themes, expenditures, about $12.6 million in the current year, $12.9 million next year, that is an increase. In the current year, about over $100,000 and then more than $1 million next year. And why is it going up? That's yeah. the big question. Some of it is due to some of these one-time one -time things, but others I have listed up here, new labor, employee, employee labor agreements, that's probably the biggest item. $430,000 citywide increase, and in the current year, $664,000 increase next year. PERS increase is the other big one. They continue to go up. Um, the current year, it's an increase of $71,000 in, in the current year, and then $208,000 next year. And that's more than what we anticipated. When we did the budget last year, we expected a big increase, but it's even greater than what we anticipated. And, and so we anticipate that to continue to go up, unfortunately, on the, un, the unfunded liability that we've talked about in previous years. And so just to give you a sense of how much of the city budget that represents, $2.4 million is the check we wrote to CalPERS, um, I guess in 15, 16, the check we will write, which is an increase of $429,000 just in two years. So significant increase that uh, we expect, unfortunately. And so that's the, the challenge I think that a lot of cities are dealing with is being able to have your revenues increase at a fast enough pace to keep up with the changes in, in PERS. And so those two alone are the biggest impacts that we have to the budget on the personnel side. Personnel is by far the largest component of the city's budget. And so anytime you have changes that drive those, that's where you're going to get, get hit. Um, fortunately, like I said, the the revenues are, are keeping pace. The, the fear is when the, the economic slowdown comes, w will that be sustainable? And so again, it goes back to maintaining that cushion, that, that reserve to be able to rely on in those years. And then the other big one which you, Council just acted on, which is that compaction issue, $50,000. It's only actually a $25,000 hit in next year because it's only six months, January through June. But I wanted to show the full, this full first year of what that impact would be. So yes. 22%, how much of that's law enforcement? 
That's Matt good. Calpert. That's a good question. Uh, I'm sure that uh, let's see if we can get that working. We can ask our finance staff to take a look at that. I don't know if that's something they'll be able to, to do really quickly. Maybe we could keep going, and as they get the number, then we can come back and have that yeah. question answered. I can tell you in general terms, it's significant. <laughs> Public safety is by far the largest part of, part of PERS. I'm not what percentage it is, I don't know, but generally speaking, public safety is a huge percentage of the city's budget to begin with. And their PERS contribution is, is more than the other miscellaneous employees. So, you know, it's going to be well above 50% would be my guess. I think people need to understand that. So yeah. So a lot of that has to do with the safety retirement and what we provide law enforcement. Yes. Yeah. And the, the, I guess the, some of the good news on the safety side is with the new retirement um, formula, it's no longer 3% at 50, so the new employees we're hiring, which has been significant, we've had a lot of new hires in the last year or two, they're coming in at what we call PEPPER employees, which is the new rate, and it's, it's a lesser amount. So the city's contribution going forward as we hire new employees, especially ones that are not transfers or laterals from other agencies, the laterals typically come in at the higher rate, but if you find them, if you get them out of the academy, um, people write off, then uh, then they come in at the lower the lower rate, and the contribution is smaller. So in the future, 20 years from now, all of the old 3% at 50s will be retired, and our entire uh, system will be based on on the lower amount. So that will be you know more sustainable. But it'll take a while for everything to trickle through the whole system. So if, if you guys come up with a percentage, just go ahead and interrupt it at, at a point in the, in the future. We'll go ahead and move on, and then. We can jump in on that one. So, so those are the big category items. Within each department, there are specific requests or things that are changing that we wanted to highlight for the city council. As you're looking through each in the budget document we presented, there's a you know adopted budget and then and then revised or recommended budget, and so it, and it shows the variance or the, the increase or the decrease in each line item. And I didn't go through every one here. These are kind of the more of the significant drivers of each one, and so we'll go through here relatively quickly, but feel free to stop me. If you have questions or concerns with any of the items we're going to outline. So for the clerk's department, a couple of things to note. There was a, a payout for the retiring city clerk that impacted that, so if you see that increase. And there was also a decrease next year because the administrative assistant um, was, was changed to an office assistant, and there was an also reduction of part-time hours within that department. City attorney, you'll see increases in professional services, largely due to some of the significant items going on. Most of the, the biggest contribution is due to the Royal Delta Inn uh, litigation lawsuit, and so we expect that to be recovered, hopefully soon. Uh, we're going to court shortly to get the uh, receiver appointed on a, on a long-term basis, and we should be able to get reimbursed for that, and that's why you saw on the revenue side a match, but there is the expenditure increase. City manager's office, um, two items. One is a recommendation to bring on a part-time temporary economic development manager or economic development specialist that can assist the city in our efforts. Again, if we want to be more sustainable, my recommendation is that we bring in somebody that can focus in their exclusive efforts on economic development activities, um, going out and helping to recruit retail, our 48, the 40-acre 40 uh, major commercial site between Simmerhorn and, and Bossau, work on the uh, the new industrial park idea of expanding north to Walnut, the, the three corners up on Twin Cities, some of the other commercial projects going after economic development grants that we might have out there. Uh, it's, as economic activity has increased or development activity has increased, particularly in the community development department, they don't have the time to dedicate to that, nor do I. And so I would be looking for somebody that's been in the business, that's got relationships with brokers, understands economic development, could go out and help us to pursue some more economic uh, development uh, goals. We don't have, not recommending at this time, a, a permanent full-time position, but I figured we could start with somebody on a temporary part-time basis and see how well it, it goes. I feel like there's, I've already had some conversations with people, that there's some good people out there that are retired or are working on a part-time basis and would, would be an asset to our, to our city. And so the recommendation is that we put some money in the budget for that position, it's about $50,000. And would that be a full-time position to the extent that they would be there every day of the week or how, how is that? It'd be part-time, so my, my, we try to keep them temporary, so under the 960 for PERS, so it would be about 20 hours a week is the amount of money we put in the budget. 
and it would be a flexible position. So there may be some weeks that they work a lot of hours, some weeks that they that they don't. Uh, they may do some work from their home. So we want to keep it as flexible as, as possible so we can find the right candidate without putting a lot of restrictions on it. We ever have a position like that in the past? Well, when I, when I first was hired, I was assistant city manager, and one of my main goals was economic development. And so we've not been able to fund the assistant city manager position, so this is kind of my less expensive approach to having an assistant focus on economic development. And just for comparison, the assistant city manager position, fully loaded benefits, is about $180,000 to $200,000 a year. So this is a much less expensive proposal, even though I'd love to have an assistant, somebody full-time that could focus on, I'm just not sure we're, we're in a financial position to do that right now. I mean, even in part-time, do you think there's sufficient work, I mean, for economic development? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think through what the specific projects you, you named, and I, I understand those. A lot of those, I know we've put out a lot of feelers in the past uh, through, you know, what was the organization out of Texas? Oh, Buxton. Buxton. Yeah. And I know we, 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 we saturated the market of everything that looked like would be a, a fit for, for, for particularly the 40-acre piece. And, it, it, you know, apparently we didn't have a whole lot of success. I, I don't, and I don't know all the reasons why, but I, I look at that and I, I'm a little skeptical um, if that's going to be the primary focus for that individual. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, the city has to know, make it uh, uh, self-aware in the marketplace, but I don't know that this type of position, I've never seen a, a, a real successful one, let's put it that way, I've never seen a good, good successful economic development program unless you're talking something, you know, in a very large city where they have a department and, and are able to focus on, on very, uh, uh, very specialized areas, uh, not so much as a broad-based uh, position. One of the things that I've wished that I had been able to do as a council member and just couldn't crowd it into my schedule was <clears throat> to attend some of the Metro Chamber and some of those organizations to network and um, let people know about golf and what we have to offer. Is this something that this person might be involved in doing? Yeah, they'd be active in the uh, regional economic development groups, they would be meeting with regional brokers and getting the city's work name out there and letting people know what we have available. And so it may, it may be that, you know, the position is only needed for a period of time. It may be that we don't need it for the number of hours. Um, but I think with, I know the city council's strategic goal of economic development always being at the top of the list, and I don't feel like we're able to dedicate enough time to that purpose right now, that this will be a positive step in the right direction that we can at least try to have somebody, 100% of their effort focus will be out there working on relationships, working on contacting retailers and other businesses, working on developing relationships with the commercial brokers, the other managers in the region, and just putting golf out there so that we're better known and that people know that uh, we have 100% emphasis on economic development because that's where our future is going to lie. If we want to keep up with these, mm -hmm. these cost increases, we need to build our base. We need to add jobs. We need to add retail. And, you know, this is, again, this is the recommendation to, to at least put a step forward in that right direction. And we can modify it. It's not, that's the beauty of a temporary position. It's not working. You can try something yeah. different in the future. But I think historically we've had some success uh, uh, bringing companies like Cardinal Glass through networking through some of the organizations. Um, so I, I would be um, supportive of trying this. Well, I, the reason Cardinal Glass came here is to the city as a, a redevelopment agency at the time, and there were significant financial incentives. Um, and they happened to just contact golf, is how that came about. It was one of the sites on their list. They came to Galt and mm -hmm. uh, the actually it was quite frankly, it was through SACTO. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, and SACTO, you know, I mean, obviously we should be in close contact with SACTO because they're a very important organization. But that whole decision was made by the plant manager because he wanted to live in Galt. And quite frankly, that's how it happens uh, many times uh, on those companies. Depends on where the manager wants to work. So. Interesting <laughs> dynamic in the Sacramento region. SACTO has actually gone away. 
Um, they've got a new organization called Greater Sacramento mm -hmm. Economic Council, something that I'm going to be bringing something forward to you guys probably in the next month or two. They're asking for, similar to where we, we supported SACO, asking for a contribution from cities. They hired a guy out of Phoenix called Barry Broom that's a dynamic guy trying to bring cities together and got, has contributions from, I think, 20 different corporations in the Sacramento region of $100,000 a year commitment from them and so they're really, so so we would have a seat on that council and be able to participate and, and try to again get our name out there a little bit. I'm not saying this is the, the solution to everything but I think it's a step in the right direction. Well, it would be really important to me that there be some real goals set for that position yeah. so that this position ends up being economically beneficial to us because I could see that we could have the position and not have any benefit coming out of it. Well, a return on investment. You could, yeah, there needs to be some return to it. That's it. We could have a person attending all sorts of meetings and going to all sorts of stuff and generating nothing. Yeah. Well, and I so think that's my concern is that I would want to make sure that that position would be very clear. That's working. They were very clear. Very um, clear expectations about where we would want to see the time being spent in and that we were getting some return for, for our investment. Agreed. Very clear expectations. Yeah. And, and it it does take a while to build those relationships so you wouldn't expect to see a new business come in within the first six months, but there should be some deliverables, some expectations about what that person will be doing. I 100% agree with that. Well, at least something that we could say we put forward this and these projects are in the works or these negotiations or you know these businesses visited us and showed an interest or right. something to the extent because like I said I think sometimes you can I tend, tend to agree with Kurt you can put a lot of money into that and have nothing happen because sometimes people companies come to businesses for lots of reasons other than um, you know other <laughs> than somebody the connections. Connections, yeah. Agreed. And I think one of the things that we could do if the council wanted, and I think this would be a good idea, is part of the monthly report that we give for other departments, we could have a specific, this individual provide a report to the council on the deliverables, on what they're, what they're doing, the contacts they've made, um, and then we can, we can gauge the success based on those, those reports. Well, I just want to uh, piggyback on council member Hewers. Uh, I'd like to see some of the stuff up front that they're going to do because I feel like that we just keep doing this over and over again with economic development. I mean, we had Buxton and then, you know, we've had some of our staff out there working on it and I'd, I'd just like to see what we think we're going to do that's different this time. Well, we've never had a person that's been dedicated. Well, we've had, to they it. haven't been dedicated, but they, yeah. you know, we've been economic developing it a lot, you know, with, with staff and so I'd just like to see what it would entail before we... I would like to, assuming we go ahead with this position, I would like to see what the strategy is of this individual on how, it, you know, what that plan is, how he plans to execute it, and what the expected results are. I mean, I think that's important to me um, rather than just hiring, and I don't know what you have specifically in mind, but I would want to know, okay, what, what are the reasonable ex expectations for this person to uh, execute and what are the expected results? I mean, that's, that's where I'm at. Well, I'm, again, I'm going to say that I think it's important that golf have a seat at the table. Uh, the things, for example, since we've become very active in SACOG in the past two years, the grants that have come out of there, the, uh, the transportation that we've uh, local transportation like the express buses. I think if we weren't there letting people know that we have that need and um, who we are, I think we would miss some of those. Uh, on a smaller side, even uh, my involvement with First Five Advisory, we've gotten funding for Fair Sight uh, School Readiness. We're looking at a children's dental clinic being established here. And again, I think if we don't have a seat at the table, we could be overlooked. I think it is important. And I think the talent of the um, whomever has this position is going to be important. And I do agree that we should have measurable goals that we can look at and be flexible if we need to, tweak it another way, but I think it's very important. Well, maybe if, if the council is um, inclined to approve 
the budget today, then what I will do is as we start the recruitment process and, and find somebody before we execute any type of employment agreement, that we give a scope of services with deliverables, goals, objectives back to the council. You can take a look at that if there's any concerns and that we wouldn't uh, uh, hire that individual until we were all on the same page with that. That works for the council? I agree. Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, like we sit down and do our strategic plan, we set uh, uh, clear goals to accomplish and a time frame in which to accomplish them. I think something along those lines would be would be good to be measurable. Uh, we just feel like we were getting some return on our investment. And Sounds good. to add on to that, although networking is all well and good, uh, with whoever this individual is, you need to make sure that they're able. Obviously, you're going to get in care of it, but it will go out there and look for grants, both federal and state, that we're not aware of. Agreed. Okay. That's a good point. So the other item under uh, city manager is kind of an, an older item that we discussed maybe a year ago with city council relating to the theater project and redevelopment. There was a, a, a lease agreement that uh, DNS development had with Epstein at the city is uh, obligated to pay that, that lease back, and that was in the amount of, I think, $9,000. So that was it's included in next year's budget. Uh, under information technology, we have money added to the current year for website redesign. Uh, this is primarily the back end stuff for our staff, but also the front, what the public sees on the website, modernizing it, incorporating you know, our Facebook and, and Twitter accounts and things like that, just making it a little bit more user friendly. It's been several years since we updated the site, so we wanted to do that. Um, annual maintenance for our Galt Connect app is included in there, addition of some additional contract service support for IT, and then replacement laptop and projector within that division. Am I working now? What, hey. What does go back? the Galt Connect mobile app? And the turf um, is Matt here? Do you remember what the annual maintenance cost is? I remember it's about six thousand dollars. About five thousand dollars. Yeah. Finance department. We have a couple different items. One is part-time addition of a part-time office assistant. Actually, not office assistant. It's a accounting assistant, accounting assistant position for the water meter program. The council saw this a month ago when we were talking about the water meter program, um, continuation of a part-time analyst, uh, some budget software related items that's, that's going to better integrate our budget software with our accounting software, um, the addition of dual monitors on various workstations. Staff has found this to be a very efficient way of, of doing things, and laptop replacement and printer replacement. Under non-departmental, we have a decrease in liability insurance, which is a good thing. We have also moved building maintenance from non-departmental as well as there used to be building maintenance in a variety of different departments. There were some was in park maintenance, um, some was in non-departmental. We've now consolidated that in, in under public works under a building new building maintenance division. And then there's also a request from the, commu the Kasumas Community Services District for city financial support for their CERT program. Council considered and approved this last year during the budget. It was just a one-year request, so they're requesting it again for next fiscal year. On, on the building, uh, or the public works building maintenance, that, that movement, you and I traded some emails back in February. And at that time, I, weren't you also going to bring forward a proposal to show uh, as an alternative if maintenance were to stay in Parks and Rec? Because I had a, there was a, the last email I looked at was probably February 17 or thereabouts. Um, the staff's, staff's recommendation, we're still going through the, well actually we've, I mean we've implemented it now, I guess it's been about three months. And so we're always looking at, at different things, but this time our recommendation is that we again consolidate that and, and move forward. If council wants to consider a different arrangement in the future, we can certainly look at that. But. Um, we don't have any other um, alternatives for council consideration at this time. So the new division didn't require any extra staff. It was just a reorg? Right. You just move, move people around and move the budget numbers around. It's just a reorg. With the uh, new division, um, does the work uh, itself change? Uh, I mean, the, the, the scope of work, or is it still the same work? 
There have been a few there have been a few changes on the building maintenance side. There's some things that they used to do, some setups for recreation programs and things that they no longer have responsibility for. That that's been shifted over to um, both park maintenance and right the recreation staff that they're doing. So it's actually freed up some of the building maintenance staff and janitorial so they can focus on a few other things. Um, but we didn't we didn't trim out their budget. We did add some money to the recreation and parks budget for that additional support because on the building side, they've always felt they've had a hard time keeping up with the workload and so this provides them with some, some additional resources to get some of that additional um, stuff done. So that's, that's what we've done. Okay, this is kind of personal for me, but can you tell me what some of the additional resources are? Well, that like I said, we moved some of their responsibilities, mostly janitorial, over from uh, building maintenance to recreation and park maintenance. So those staff now, they have less work to do, but the same number of staff to do it. What about the janitorial is under the building maintenance? It is, but we took some of the things away from them. So before, for example, and Armando could probably explain better than I can so as far as what, big what was moved. Taking away from that you did janitorial services? It's actually a lot of hours that uh, they're gaining. They would have to leave a building that they're cleaning to set up for either basketball or set up for our uh, senior bingo meals on wheels after using the center for, for the night. So what we've done is instead of bringing them off of their, their current building cleaning, they stay there, they're stationed there or whatever Aiden has them uh, assigned to. They no longer have to leave the lock up parts, turn on lights, uh, set up buildings lock buildings, so that's all handled now with park and staff. A comment, Armando, on just how well the transition is going and how things are working from, from your perspective? At this point, I think they're working well. Uh, we, it's, there's one voice, it's our building, our programs, our staff that's going through and closing, opening, turning on and off. So instead of trying to go, well, that's you, that's me, that's it's us now. So there is one, one number to call, one division to talk to, one department. Well, that's why I don't understand why the whole department didn't go over there. Because that was the job of the person that had your job before that, correct? Yes, but there was also two uh, mid-manager positions that were filled at the time also. There was a park superintendent and a uh, recreation supervisor. Any other questions on that one? So under the police department, Jason, before yes. you go on, um, did I miss, did you talk about the council section that we have in our report? I didn't see it up there. You know, I think I, I don't know if I included that one or not. There was one minor change to the council. We actually had a um, former council member that passed away that was receiving, uh, yes. was <laughs> receiving uh, medical benefits right. and obviously that's no longer the case. So that's, if you're wondering why there was a reduction off of benefits for the council, that was the reason for that. That wasn't it. It was an uh, increase in the current fiscal year is primarily, primarily due to expending funds received for Winter Bird Festival. I didn't understand. Okay. Oh, so what that means is we, actually the Winter Bird Festival was much more successful than we anticipated, so we had a lot more revenue coming in, which also means we had more expenses. Oh. So, but it was pretty much offset. It was offset by revenue. The Winter Bird Festival did not lose money for the city. There's actually a little bit of a surplus that will go into next year's event. Okay, so, thank you. Sure. Okay, so police. We had some different, some changes. Operations, primarily results of the new 12-hour shift, the new, the new schedule that uh, the council approved recently. So we transferred one of the patrol sergeants into detectives. So you see an increase in in detectives and a decrease in, in operations. There's also a reduction in overtime. And that's partly, again, a result of the shift changes and we have deeper teams now. So we anticipate the reduction in, in overtime. We also had a lot more hires this last year than we've had in previous years. So our uniform budget was higher than budgeted and anticipated. We're also using some of that one-time revenue to buy some additional replacement patrol vehicles. We talk about one of the big expenses in the police department is vehicles and they go through those relatively quickly and they're not cheap, about $50,000 total for uh, the vehicle and all the outfitting and things that go along with, with them. So we have three replacement patrol vehicles and one detective vehicle. So that, so detectives again, you'll see a, 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 an increase in their budget because they're absorbing the 
uh, the, the sergeant from patrol and operations, you see a decrease. This batch, there's some savings there because of vacancies. We have, I think, two or three vacancies, three in dispatch right now. So overtime's up a little bit, but we have savings on the on the other side that more than, than make up for that. So community development department, a couple different changes under planning. The council earlier this year approved. Did you have something? I was going to say I believe Matt had some information on the police. First, first percentage, okay. Okay. So the the safety is 46% of the, the full-time first cost and 43% of the city's overall first costs. Thanks, Matt. So under planning, the big change that the council previously approved is the change from a, a senior planner to principal planner. Under building safety and inspection services, the big recommendation is to unfreeze the building official position, appoint the incumbent senior building inspector, and then refreeze or freeze the senior building inspector position. Under public works administration engineering, we are also recommending another un unfreezing a position, which is the engineering technician position. This is due to increased demand relating to new development activity as well as the new water conservation. Uh, initiatives by the city. This position will supervise those two temporary uh, technician, technician water conservation technician positions that we've been talking about. Also reclassing a uh, administrative assistant to a supervising administrative assistant. We still have, even though we're unfreezing that position, and the other one is a net neutral because it's an unfreezing and then a refreezing, we still have a number of frozen positions throughout the city in, in various departments. Public Works, Central Shop, just one um, item of note, and that's a new smog diagnostic system. This is something that the, the mechanic is, is recommending to save the city costs in the long run. Instead of taking all the vehicles to the shop to get mm -hmm. the outside to get smog checked, we can have our own machine, run our own vehicles, and we have a large fleet that it'll save us both time and money in the long run. Mm -hmm. Public Works, Building Maintenance, we already talked about this. This is a newly created uh, position, better capture of costs. The only really significant increase in that budget is to a new truck replacement vehicle uh, for their staff. Shifting now to Parks and Recreation, Fund 6, revenues. Pretty much status quo, a little bit of a decrease in revenues in the current year, about $11,000, and then next year about a little less than $60,000 compared to the revised budget. Some of this is related to the discontinuation of the city-owned market concessions. Council remembers that uh, council approved that uh, trailer maybe a year ago and staff's been giving it their best, but it hasn't been as successful as we had hoped. And so we, instead of continuing to lose money on it, we think it's best just to, just to walk away. We will continue to use that trailer as an investment that we can take out to Walker Park and other events to be able to, to, um, to sell those concession items. Uh, at those various facilities, but from a market perspective, we think it's best to just discontinue, can, can discontinue this. Was it mostly the, the uh, cost to, uh, for personnel to man it? Was that? You know, the, I'll let Monda speak to it, but I think it was just the demand for the type of food that was being sold. The people were not, I think, uh, so it wasn't that our costs were higher than expected. I think the revenue wasn't as Damn. high. The, the sales weren't as high as what we expected. And, and that's what it was. It was the, the revenue um, we had anticipated in comparison it, comparing it to our uh, concession stand at the sports complex. It, it just, we couldn't meet costs and we were seemed to be losing money and it wasn't from lack of uh, staff trying. They've, uh, they tried. They've changed their menu. They've done everything that they thought they could at the time mm -hmm. to try and make it go, and it it, it just wouldn't go. So, so what are we going to do with the concessions now? Right now, we're evaluating it. We're trying to get some schedules out at Walker, Walker Park. We currently do not have concession stand out there. Uh, we want to utilize that during the fall when we have all three fields being uh, run, and we're hoping to maybe make, recoup some of the cost that way. During the fall, the football runs concessions in the football stadium, correct? Well, the soccer, we have two soccer organizations that do not have concessions. We have um, some private rentals that we'd like to start using 
our concession stand in, that's when we would use it. If uh, it's the Liberty Junior Hawks that are out there, we at this point we wouldn't compete with them. We wouldn't open it. We would just stay away during that point. So, in what circumstances would you use it? Uh, again, Golf FC, County Line Youth Soccer, they have games out there on the weekends. Any tournaments that are scheduled out there. Uh, we have adult football that schedules games out there. We'd like to use it during those events also. What about um, the baseball field at Community Park? Do we have concessions there? Concessions there. We, we do not. We have a building <laughs> there that is not permitted. And when, uh, op when that was operational, it just didn't make a lot of money. Could it possibly be used there? during the season? We could. Um, again, for the time out, the time that we use it, one of the mm -hmm. reasons we're successful at the complex tournaments, they're all day long. They're turnover, three fields, where the community park has one field. The adult games or older youth are probably about two, two and a half hours a game. And they don't play back-to-back -back games normally. They usually just leave the, as soon as they're done. Okay. I wasn't on the council when that decision was made, so I just have a question about who staffs this? I mean, we're, what staff are staffing these consistent They were actually rec workers. Um, so we were under the market. from other duties to do this? No, they were specifically hired for this? Yes. So are we continuing to? No, not at this oh, point. So they're going to be laid off? Or We've whatever? reassigned them and one has uh, submitted their resignation. So then we're utilizing them in other areas? Of yes, the we are. Any other questions on that? The only other really significant change on the revenues is there's an increase in revenue for special interest classes. Some of the more recent ones that, that Parks and Rec Department has tried have been very successful. One is the, uh, what do you call it, the paint, wine and paint. So that continues to, to sell out. Very successful, very popular out at Brewster's. If you haven't tried it yet, you should go out and check it out. Okay, on the expenditure side. Parks and Recreation, uh, there's a recommended increase of about $150,000 in, in, in the first in the current year, and then next year it's actually decreased because we've moved some of those monies again um, to the building maintenance side. Uh, for administration, we're proposing to increase some part-time hours for, for office assistant positions due to the additional workload with assuming the uh, park maintenance staff. There's an increase in supplies and materials for new tables and chairs out at the Shibola Center. Are those the ones for the senior? Um, yes, for the senior uh, fitness fitness okay. chair, uh, the ones that uh, you had asked about. Yes. Right. Okay. So they'll be they'll be pleased. I thought we just got them new chairs. These are specifically for for a fitness and the chair exercise oh, okay. program. Yes. We did get some other new chairs. And I don't think they like the new chairs. They're good for other purposes, but not for the fitness. Everything program. except for that fitness and the yeah. chair. <laughs> yeah. Except they chose the new chairs. Maybe they should exercise them when they were choosing them. <laughs> so we also have an increase in IT expenditures for some new. The Parks and Rec wants to have a couple of centralized workstations for some of the part-time temporary staff as well as park maintenance staff that come and go from the office. Don't have an office, but they can do their assignments and work in their, uh, the, the middle area of the office over there. On the parks maintenance side, uh, again, there's a decrease because of the transfer to uh, building maintenance. There are some additional capital costs. Some of the, the, the council already aware of the Littleton Stove Project. There's a one replacement vehicle on their budget, um, the Shibola renovation, panic door hardware, et cetera. There's also some additional expenses out at the parks some replacement safety bark, the sand blows away and gets down to a, a, a level that is unsafe and so we need to replenish some of that. We'll be putting some bark in or whatever, what is it called, not called bark, what do they call it? Engineered wood fiber <laughs> that uh, we'll be putting in a lot of those playgrounds instead of the sand so it's uh, more hygienic. We'll also be um, there's some miscellaneous tools and equipment for staff, the vehicle repairs and maintenance. Their, their fleet is getting pretty old, and so there's one replacement vehicle, but also some of their other vehicles will get into the shop and fix them up a little bit. Uh, and then some additional tree maintenance service, services for sometimes removal and, and mistletoe and things of that sort. On the recreation side, uh, not a lot of changes, mostly just moving money from 
there the main recreation budget to new budgets for SOAR, which is the after school program and the city tots program. It's easier for staff to account for it when they have their own divisions and so instead of having them all lumped together, they're separating them out and so you'll see some changes there. On the aquatic side, in the, in the cur current year, you'll see some increases, mostly with heat, light, and power. We had a fall swim program for the Gulf Gators and that resulted in increased costs, but there's also increased revenue that helped pay for that, so that paid for itself. There's also some re replacement shade canopy structures out there, not the, the, the structures themselves, but the actual fabric materials are just, they're, they're wearing and we need to replace them. Out of the Gulf market, there's a couple things where I talked about the discontinuation of concessions. There's also a replacement of our old <laughs> vendor reservation system that was made specifically for the Gulf market many years ago and it's not a very good system anymore and so staff is recommending uh, replacing that with a program called, what is it called, remember? Booth Tracker. Booth Tracker. So we think it'll be uh, much easier to, to use and, and implement. On off the shelf program? If I could have our market manager talk about it. <laughs> It's a company that actually does software for flea markets. We belong to the National Flea Market Association. Um, they come every year and a lot of the larger markets across the country use this software and it's been um, successfully implemented there and they're very happy with it. Uh, it's been around for about 10 years so it's, you know, it has a proven track record. Um, not new software by any means but they, they support it 24-7 so we can always have support and we would, of course, work with IT as far as implementing it as well. Okay, for PD, Measure R, revenues similar to the general fund sales tax, there's an increase in Measure R projected for next year due to that accounting change, the additional two months that I mentioned earlier, it's one time. Um, there's also an increase in personnel costs, both fiscal years due to the recent negotiations that were incorporated for recruitment and retention. Uh, the, the, the big change that we're recommending is taking a currently vacant dispatch position and changing it to part-time, full-time to part-time and taking a current uh, part-time records assistant position and turning it into a full-time position. And this is a recommendation from the police department that they feel that is where the need is right now within the department. It does not affect any, any of the dispatch positions because that's a, it's a vacant position. So we can, we can make that change while the position remains vacant. Again, um, if you have questions about that, I'm sure that the chief will attempt to, be able to talk about that in depth, but it is a recommendation to deal with the current needs of the department. Okay, uh, moving on, under enterprise fund expenditures, not a lot of changes here for stormwater, water, wastewater, there's a cost share for a, a truck, new truck. Uh, two temporary positions will be changed to part-time status in water, solid waste. Um, There's just an error when we did the budget last year, there were some overestimates on the expenditure side, so we've revised those accordingly. Capital funds, we'll talk about that more when we get to the CIP, that's where most of the, the items are, but generally there's a, an increase in revenues resulting from new, from traffic or capital impact fees with new development, also an increase in, um, on the expenditure side. Other significant areas of other, some of the other funds are landscape and lighting districts. We've been talking about this now for a couple of years. Both the northeast and the west side continue to spend more money than, than we have coming in. They are districts that were formed many years ago that have never had any kind of cost of living adjustment and we know that costs have gone up significantly just in, just in the last couple of years with PERS and salaries, but you can imagine districts that were formed when the late 80s, early 90s, I mean it's been decades now and with no, no adjustment they're just simply running out of money. and so. Uh, we're, we're trying to balance the best time to bring that forward to the City Council. We understand there's other, you know, changes in the works and so we're recommending bringing on a consultant to help us analyze the districts, come up with the best way to, to, to make some recommendations to the Council and so we'll be, we'll be getting on that uh, shortly. But overall for the Northeast Landscape and Lighting Districts, I'm going to talk about that in greater detail in a second as far as what the necessary um, what the operating deficit is in both funds. 
Um, Northeast area still has enough funds in its in its fund balance to make it through the next year. The west side doesn't. It, it's out of money, and so it requires both a reduction in service and a subsidy from the general fund in order to be to be solvent. When you um, talk about reduction in services, what are you talking about? I expect we're going to hear if we reduce the services, but what are you talking I'm about? Sure, I'm sure we will hear from it. So mm -hmm. staff is still working on what that's going to, we're going to try to find areas that are going to be the least impactful to the community. And so, but it may be instead of two prunings a year, there's one pruning a year. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing is that with our reduction in water, that is cutting some of our costs, not enough to balance it, but we, we have seen a reduction in some of our costs there. I think our, our staff, Anthony and Armando, are meeting with the landscape contractors to come up with some some places to cut. I don't know, have you guys had that meeting yet or do you guys come up with some different areas? Had that meeting and we've asked them to, to give us a reduction schedule okay. by reducing it in the L and L's. So okay. we're waiting on that. So what you, what you what we may find, this is typical when cities have these landscape and lighting districts that are in a deficit. In order for the public to to see the impact of what you're, here's the amount of money we're collecting, here's what it pays for. In order to get an increased pass in the future, you need to show them what that level of service actually looks like. If the city continues or decides to subsidize it, there will never be a need for any kind of increase within the district. And so, again, we are recommending a partial subsidy uh, from the general fund, but that's not sustainable. And so we need to work towards getting in a, a ballot measure uh, back, not a ballot when it comes to being on the November ballot, but uh, a mail-in uh, procedure that we have to go through for Prop 218 where the voters out there um, in both districts would have to vote on an increase. And if, if an increase is not approved, then what would that level of service look like? And so that's what we'll be working on over the next several months to be able to show and tell the neighbors, here's what your money pays for, here's what we need in order to maintain the current level of services. Do we have a rough idea what the increase would be? No, we've not looked at that yet. Yuck. Okay, transfers. Oh, before you move yes. on, um, in the report under enterprise fund revenue, it says that talking about cost well, we no longer estimate due to a lack of demand for the new well at this time. That doesn't seem to go along with our need for water. Could you explain that? Uh, well, let me take a first shot at that, and uh, certainly Mark Clark can see here in the audience. Uh, I can elaborate further if you'd like. Um, we've been looking at our water system with water conservation. We are seeing our reduced demand. Um, and we also have been looking at our current treatment sites and asking ourselves where would the best location for a new well be. And we actually, um, uh, with the Eastview development, are, uh, will be getting a well site dedication and future um, water impact fees could be used to put a new deep well there, which actually would be more cost effective in all likelihood than sort of a landlocked site at cost well site would still remain available in the future. This was a proposal to borrow money. Mm -hmm. I get an SRF loan which would have to be paid back. And uh, with our current demands, uh, with the city doing well and with further reductions mandated for the current year, um, we think our money would be better spent uh, on a different site than cost and later on if things became dire or if we had well failures, we could revisit the cost well site uh, in the future. How quickly, if we um, got into a situation, though, could you make that happen? Well, we, we're looking. We're talking about long-term uh, needs of the city. Mm -hmm. um, when the arsenic issue kind of raised its head, we were uh, struggling, and we had four wells that got rehabilitated um, with the new deep well up and running at Golden Heights. Uh, that's doing the lion's share of sort of our our demand and peak demand needs and with rehabilitating four wells this past year, we think we're sitting or positioned well for the short term. Uh, as each few comes in, our thought would be to have them bring on a new deep well uh, as part of our capital improvement program. Um, and that would then, again, give us several thousands of gallons a minute of additional. Right now, uh, we have the ability to produce 150% of our peak month or peak day in the summer. So 
we would not recommend further investment at this time. Now, if our demands change or if growth accelerates, then growth would be bringing on that new impact and mitigating that through our fee program. Okay, thank you. I think you asked how long. I think that, like I say, for the short term, we've got 50% of okay. supplemental capacity, but we could certainly uh, get a new well designed, sited, permitted, and up and running probably in the time frame. Okay, thank you. So tr transfers, these are items, this, this is money that mostly that services provided by general fund uh, departments, finance, city managers, city attorney, um, information technology provide services to other entities, so our enterprise fund, landscape and line districts, other, other entities, and how we recover those costs. We do a cost allocation plan. One of the things you're going to see on the June 2nd meeting, and I'm going to mention here, is a change in how we implement the cost allocation plan. Uh, several years ago, we changed to do a three-year average. And that was done, I think, initially in 2010, and we revised it further in 2014. What we're, and we did that to kind of smooth it out so you wouldn't have these, these peaks and valleys. But what we're finding now is that when we have a, a new change, for example, we're out of position in finance. It's a position really for water services or sewer services. Because we have a three-year average, it takes three years to fully recover those costs as opposed to doing it the way we used to do it, which we'd be able to recover those costs um, right away. And so it's a, it's a, it's a bear or a, a burden on the general fund that we don't think should be borne. And so we're recommending going back to the old way of doing it, which is we do the cost allocation plan one year, and then it's implemented the next year. We still then are subject to some of those, those peaks and valleys, but we think that's a better approach than, uh, than the three-year average. And, and um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about that, but again, you'll have a more detailed report on June 2nd, but that is what's implemented in the budget document that you see here. And again, the council's not voting on, on the budget document tonight. We're looking for a recommendation so that when we bring it back to you at the next meeting for, for adoption, we can make sure that we make any of those adjustments. So to the extent that you do have um, comments or concerns or changes, we'd like to hear those tonight uh, or today. Inez? I know that uh, Councilmember Campion actually requested to look at some more, just a recap sheet of what the amount of the cost allocation amounts were under schedule. I believe it's five. It's a little hard because it just gives you the total amount, but he was asking specifically for the cost of support services. So I do have that available. We did work on that, so we can certainly pass it out this evening or want to just review it and discuss it at the future date, then we can sure. do that. That's fine. Okay. Maybe get us put it in our box and everybody can take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. A couple other items of note in the cost allocation plan, solid waste fund. This was an item we brought up to the council last year that we had concern because the general fund was subsidizing that. The council approved that 2% increase back in March, so that's wiped out that deficit. And so the solid waste fund is now able to fully support itself. Culture and recreation fund uh, does not fully support itself. In other words, it can't, doesn't, doesn't generate enough revenue through the market and its own programs to support all of the operations. And so in... Uh, there's a shortfall in both years, about $920,000 and $653,000 in both years. That amount has been backfilled by the general fund. So when we always talk about the, the link and connection between 01 and 06, general fund and culture and recreation, it's because a lot of the culture and recreation costs are paid for from the general fund because it can't fully fund itself. So when you make a change on culture and recreation, it also affects general fund because it's Say, for example, you increase costs in culture and recreation, there's no more money in culture and recreation, so it has to be then back from the general fund. So any additional cost you do there has a, has a direct impact on the general fund. And, and likewise the same, if you reduce your costs on culture and recreation, that has a positive benefit on the, on the general fund because you don't have to backfill as much. And this is, this is nothing new. We've been in that situation for a while, though we, we uh, anyways, were you going to, did you have a well, why comment are we question? Well, why are the decrease for... 2015-16. You said there was a shortfall of 920. Oh, why does why it go from 920 to 653? 653. I'm not sure. There had to be an increase somewhere, an increase in revenue, right? Or, or a reduction in expenditures. Oh, no. We did have a, a, a big reduction because we moved um, building maintenance from parks and recreation from, we moved the building maintenance out of Parks and Rec and moved them over into uh, building maintenance. So that's probably an impact 
and so that's all being covered by general fund? Yes, so, so building maintenance now is a general fund operation, so it's a direct charge as opposed to a transfer amount that we did, we did that, so that's showing up there. We also have increased costs um, in both years, but that, that wouldn't explain that. That's probably the biggest impact, Inez or Greg or Matt. The cost for the transfer of those employees, it was $96,000 transfer expenditure from Culture Rec to the journal fund. Okay. Um, I'd like to look at the revenue as well. I believe that there was an increase to the salt market revenues projected. Are the, well, I was just looking for that, are these, the Culture and Recreation Fund and the General Fund, are these transfers based on the cost allocation plan? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the transfer is based on the cost allocation plan, and then whatever the deficit is in Culture and Recreation, it's backfilled in by the, the General Fund. And so if I, re, if I remember correctly, I think there was more cost of support services for Culture and Recreation in 15, 16 that there had been, or in, in in prior years, and so that may explain some of it as well. Do you have the, the actual amount went up? It's just over um, about 1.3 million dollars of support services. It covers their, all the departments from council administration to planning, engineering, and so based on the work effort and cultural recreation programs, a lot of the park development. So it did go up. So. So we already talked about the west side and northeast landscape lighting districts. Again, the, the, the deficit in west side is $44,000 in 15-16, and the northeast area is $138,000. There's no backfill necessary for northeast because there is sufficient funds for next year, but the following year, 16-17, that deficit will be gone and we'll have to do something. Uh, west side is, is, does not have enough next year, and so again, we're recommending a budget transfer or loan from the general fund in the amount of 14000 and then a reduction of services of 17000 to make up that, that difference. And landscape and lighting district number three, that's the newest one and that's not as much of a concern just because that's a, a newer district. We don't really anticipate it having enough revenue to fully cover all the costs. Right now we're charging uh, most of the costs for Walker Park to that district and Walker Park expenses exceed the revenues generated from that. And so that is uh, made up then as a backfill from Culture and Recreation and the general fund with the amount of uh, 35000 in the current year and then 8000 next year. So it's getting better. So we anticipate as more homes come online and pay into that district that that'll, that'll self-correct. And that one is the only district that we have that has a uh, CPI adjustment in it so we can keep, keep up with the cost of inflation. So are you going to come back to us with what the reduction in services is going to be? I'd like to see on the west side what we're going to reduce services. Yes. Uh, let's see. A few other adjustments when we got this thing to print. Staff noticed a few corrections or errors in the information that we submitted, so these items will correct those. We saw a double entry in revenues on Fund 12 Quimby Parkland Fund. There was a double entry for the sale of the former Boys and Girls Club property over on 5th Street, so the revenue is overstated in the current year by 100, about $180,000. Uh, also there was a, a vacant senior wastewater systems operator position that was inadvertently deleted or eliminated from the budget. We do intend to fill that and so we would like to add that back to the budget. Um, I think there's a summary of these items as well that will be distributed. I know that you have that for the, uh, the council, those items, we need to pass those around, but the summary is up here, so, um, but we would ask that the council just, we'll, we'll, we'll be planning on bringing these back with the final adopted budget, we wanted you to be aware of them, and the final one is just moving, there was $25,000 for that vehicle replacement for detectives, right now it's showing up in your budget under operations, and it should be showing up under detectives, so we're just proposing to move that line item down. How long has the senior wastewater systems operator position been vacant? It was a new position that was created last year that's never been filled, if I remember right. Yes, and as we're moving forward with the major wastewater treatment plant upgrade project, the goal would be to have them on board as we begin to operate those. So we're actually going to be recruiting for that pretty quickly. 
And if I might uh, apologize, normally I have a no surprises clause, but I was informed as we walked into the meeting and I was doing some quick conferring that we missed a minor uh, cleanup as we're carving out the new building maintenance division. We have zero overtime created as part of the new budget that should have been brought over. With that, we'll need to work with finance and city manager, Parks and Rec. Uh, typically, we would expect to have about $2,000. Unfortunately, buildings don't always have leaks and things during normal working hours. So we, since we had a major, we joked about a water feature, Parks and Rec, when we had a sprinkler blow off during the August heat wave last year. So obviously, we scramble after hours to try to address it. So we'll work with the city manager and we'll get right back on June 2nd. We'll Okay, we'll include that in the budget that you guys see on, on June 2nd. Any other changes that staff has caught in the interim? There is an item on CIP that we'll address when we get to the CIP. There are no other um, comments or questions. Staff's recommendation is that the council receive this report, ask any further questions, provide any comments or direction from staff on any adjustments that you would like to see. Um, and and open it up for any public comment. Mm -hmm. And based on those recommendations or comments from council, we'll proceed to bring back the final budget for adoption at the next council meeting. If I could ask one question on um, schedule four, summary of resources and requirements by fund, um, fund 091 low moderate income housing we estimated, uh, uh, I guess, a negative of two million. Would, does that have to do with redevelopment, or? I know, do you want to address that? Sure. Yes, it is the actually the low moderate income housing fund, um, and we have provided various loans to that fund. But because there, we're in that transitional period, city does not want to take the position to go ahead and normally do a cash transfer just so it is a positive at the end of each fiscal year end. So at this point, it is city's recommendation or staff's recommendation that we continue to show it in a deficit. We prefer not to show a deficit for budgeting purposes. In fact, it's illegal if you are spending more than we have available. This is one of those exceptions, though, that, that uh, we want the public to know that it is a deficit based on actions of the state. Are we talking about the redevelopment agency? Okay. Thank you. Any more questions from council? Okay, I don't see any uh, requests from the public. Do I have a motion to receive? Okay. Yes. Motion by Councilmember Campion, second by Vice Mayor. Call for vote. Vice Mayor Payne? Aye. Councilmember Hewer? Aye. Councilmember Campion? Aye. Councilmember Powers? Aye. And I will say aye myself, so it passes 5 0. Okay, we'll bring the final adjustments back to the City Council at the next Council meeting. Very good. Moving on to recommended 2014 2019 Capital Approval Program budget. Mr. Winkler, you want to switch over to the CIP PowerPoint? <laughs> While he's doing that, I know you said something, but I think uh, uh, looking at the staff out there, I think we also want to say thank you for all those hours and headaches that uh, occurred in putting this together. I don't envy you at all. <laughs> you all right, didn't beat so, him up too much, did you? What's that? You didn't beat them up too much. No, they're good. I really enjoy working with our staff, really good, hardworking people. So capital improvement program, this is the item that accompanies the budget. This plans for long range capital needs of the city. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, long range planning document of the city. We go out five years, but then we also go out beyond that. And we want to make sure that we're addressing the, the infrastructure appropriately for the city. And this is an area that I think um, staff has really done an exceptional job of over the last several years, particularly during the economic recession. We were building. We were building. We were building water systems, sewer systems, road systems, other other things that we needed to be a sustainable community. And and I'm much more comfortable now than we were four or five years ago with some of the major infrastructure improvements 
not only the interchanges, but Live Oak Lift Station, the wastewater treatment plant, new wells. I mean, these are some significant things that have been done that you should be proud of and proud that your staff has, has done a really good job of bringing these things to fruition. I think members of the public don't see them. They're often hidden, but they're going to be grateful for in the future when we have continue to have reliable services for them. So again, detailed look in, within the five years, and then we actually go beyond that and we update it every year. So these are some of the projects that we finished or expect to finish before the end of this fiscal year. Uh, phone system replacement projects, MSC, uh, building maintenance improvements, new HVAC system, police department, building renovation includes uh, roof renovation, the Fallen Heroes Memorial, the council is very familiar with, railroad quiet zones, centrical interchange landscaping, traffic capital improvement program update. You'll see that I think at the next council meeting. Uh, water capacity improvements. This is the Simmerhorn water line. Staff was out there, not staff. The contractor was out there today um, buttoning that up, redoing the, the shoulder pavement. Um, they should be done. It's not going to be a long project. They should be out of there pretty soon, right? This week. So finishing that project up. Water meter retrofit. That is still on schedule. Hopefully all the water meters will be in the ground by the end of June. We have annual well rehabilitation, wastewater treatment plant, capital maintenance projects, live oak pump station and force main replacement, annual lift station rehabilitation, and then a variety of different pieces of equipment that the council approved and authorized this last year. Total of $15 million worth of projects in the last year. Very busy, very significant projects. In addition to all those projects that were on the completed list, we have a number of other projects that are underway and things that the public doesn't necessarily see yet, but staff is busy, frantically busy um, getting these things done. And, and let me maybe take just a minute to comment on staff and workload. Public Works Department has done an amazing job, in my opinion, of moving these projects forward. They are, I think, in some ways, you know, up to their their ears and then some in delivering these projects and I see Glenn running around crazy trying to get these things done but they really do a, a great job and for the number of staff that we have they deliver an extraordinary number of projects and again speaks to the, the dedication and the pride they take in the work that they do. I think the number of projects that we do are comparable to cities much larger than us and uh, we just we find a way to get it done and so a lot of these projects are nearly all managed by our, our public works department, our engineering department, and, and it's just I can't speak highly enough of the job they do. And so I'll, I'll say that with, a, with an accolade, but I'll also do it with a sense of, of caution from myself and, and the city council that we have to be cautious in how much more we continue to load on that department. Uh, so new projects, if we have new great ideas, we have to prioritize and take stuff off the list in order to add new items on the list, or we need to add additional staff. This is one of the reasons why we're asking for the council to unfreeze that engineering tech position because they will help in delivering some of these projects. And so we don't want to, we don't want the projects to slip in particular projects where we get grant funding. We need to make sure that SACOG knows that we're a city that can deliver projects. We can use the money that they give to us appropriately. And so it's important that we stay on task with those things. And like I said, our staff has really done an amazing job. So. So here's some of the things give you a sense of what, what? they're, yes. I don't see the community center upgrades. Oh, for the Littleton yeah. stoves? Was it on here? I don't see it on here. It's, um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't under the completed list because that's, it's obviously not completed yet. It should be under the underway list um, because it's, uh, we're, Steve, maybe you can give an update for the not council on, I mean, no. on that one. Yeah, I just no, it's, it's, it should be on there. It's not on there, uh, but it, sh it should be. Yeah, and you've got a past to memo sort of a mea culpa on where uh, we've run into a number of uh, technical challenges that we're now seeking to, uh, to address, uh, including uh, getting some outside help to help us get a scope of work written so we can do a turnkey sort of design bid permit process uh, and we hopefully will be back on track here uh, in June of getting a contractor and we'll be bringing that back to you for uh, uh, an award because we will be over in all likelihood the $30,000 award limit. 
So we're, we're moving. Well, it's probably going to take a budget adjustment. <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. You well, say. we're. I mean, it's going to take more money than we, what we We haven't said. received those proposals yet, and hopefully we can live within the budget. Uh, we already upped the budget twice to try to address the going to full gas, new ranges, and with all the hood upgrades and fire upgrades and ventilation upgrades. So right now our fingers are crossed, but until we get the proposal, it's kind of like we'll wishful thinking happens. until we'll you see, see what happens. Yeah. So we, even if it's within budget, we still have to come back to the council because if it's over a certain dollar threshold, then the, con the council has to award that, that contract. So fingers crossed, hopefully it'll Actually, be successful. Actually, if, if we look at it as a public improvement, I think we will likely not need to bring it back in that we have $175,000 as a public improvement. But if it's a goods and services where we're hiring somebody to upgrade, then, then we get into a gray area. So we'll be working. Hmm. The manager and city attorney to see whether it's appropriate to bring it back or if we can just get it done. There you go. If we if we can do it under the purchasing policy, we'll just move on it. If we don't need any more money from the council, then we'll get it constructed as quickly as we can. So here's some items. A lot of these are grant funded projects. The staff been very successful. Public Works, our rep Mark Cruz on the SACOG uh, board of of getting some some grant funding for the city and. Here's a list of, of some of those items and bicycle lane improvements, um, C Street, Central Belt Complete Streets projects, <coughs> nearing, nearing final design and environmental uh, wastewater treatment plant operations and, and maintenance manuals projects, MPDS renewal project, um, water treatment plant operation and maintenance, the big wastewater treatment plant upgrade project, Harvey Park renovation, Complete Streets, Rehab A Street, ABA sidewalk uh, improvements, Regional Law Enforcement Training Center, the council recently awarded um, sewer capital maintenance projects, transit operation maintenance center, so some other big heavy lifting projects that are going to be going in design or already in design. You'll see those coming about this coming year. So I don't necessarily want to go through every one of these, these projects. The council has seen a lot of these things. A lot of these are just moving money around from one year to another. These, we have CIP broken up into different categories. The first one is general improvements. These are ones that kind of general improvements for the city that don't fall into the categories of water, wastewater, traffic, parks, etc. Um, I did have a question on that on the on the MSC building. What, was there a project plan that is not going to move forward for the $32,000 reduction? Oh, I think that's cost savings. The HVAC project came in, came in less expensive than we oh, thought okay. it was. Okay. I, I'm correct in that, Steve. Yes, and we're reprogramming that to another okay. unit. Yeah. And then what sound barriers are associated with Quiet Zone? I, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> uh, probably pedestrian barrier. It's not a sound barrier. It's our... The medians. Our urban chic fence that we put up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's no sound barriers out there. No. <laughs> okay. the, the, the remaining work that's going to be done out there are uh, medium improvements on C Street and A Street to prevent people from going around the arms and as well as some other uh, improvements in, in the street right away itself. Does that have any questions on any of the items under general improvements? Do we have a timeline on when the quiet zone will take effect after we finish all this? I think once the work is done, it's 60 days before it gets implemented. Is that right, Gwen? And we're how, how soon until the actual work is, is done? I think they're just about ready to. You want to grab the mic? Yeah, we were um, based on last council a couple meetings ago. Uh, some funding adjustments. Uh, the contractor. Go ahead. Okay, so the contractor has purchased the appropriate insurance. They're working with UPRR to get the encroachment permit, and. That's not necessarily an easy process. We're working with UPRR, um, and we're trying to help them facilitate that. So that's our constraint right now. Is as soon as they get that encroachment permit, it will not take them very long to complete, to complete the improvements. The work is just several weeks, but it takes several months to get the approval for several weeks' work. Um, knock on wood, if you ask for a commitment, we were hoping to give you a Christmas present this past year, so that obviously didn't happen. So uh, we hope that uh, we'll have a nice, safe, quiet crossing for Halloween this year. So you expect to get an encroachment permit from uh, the railroad within the next couple of months? Well, 
It's been submitted to UPRR. Um, our encroachment permit is already approved. It's just the encroachment permit for the contractor to actually do the work to, to justify they have all of the um, appropriate insurance, et cetera. Um, it could be any day. It could be a couple of months. I, I actually had to, for our encroachment permit, um, basically hound them. And multiple phone calls, emails, you know, um, it, it's not an easy process. It, it's not a hard, let me rephrase it, it's not a hard process, it's very, very long and slow. Well, considering it took 30 years for us to get to this point, yeah, I understand. Thank you. We're, we're hoping for the any day now. <laughs> And then did I understand you correctly in saying after we got the work done, it was another 60 days after that? Is that what I heard you say? Uh, there's a, a process that, that the PUC actually uh -huh. independently does and so the railroad authority, but all the ducks are lined up. So hopefully that will actually be streamlined when we get there. But since nothing's been streamlined yet, uh, <laughs> we're, being, we're trying to manage expectations a little. I'd love to throw you with uh, July 4th, but I can't promise that. There's a notification timeline of how long it, it takes for when we notify the railroad, uh, FRA, and CPUC for when they are um, required to implement it. Typically, they don't implement it any quicker than that notification period, which is uh, 60 days. Thank you. One other item to note that the council may be interested in, and that's the PD roof project. If you remember when we started this project in 2014, before the rains hit, we had staff up there doing the work, and staff's gotten really busy with other stuff, so we're actually recommending an appropriation of some additional funds from a project savings, I believe, um, that would go to hire some contractors to get out there and finish the, the roofing work up there. So that's the... $24,000, $25,000 amount that you see up there for that project. Um, and then the project we just talked about the last meeting, which is the 4th Street open space project on the railroad property, moving that CDBG money and putting that in there, that's what that is about. Parks and Recreation, just three projects here. Animal Vista Park Bridge. Um, this is actually a condition right now that's on a, a, a home subdivision. I can't remember what the name of that uh, subdivision is called. Emerald. Emerald Park Unit 24. Emerald Park Unit 24. Um, they will be constructing that bridge, so we we no longer need to uh, put that in the CIP. And then some changes to Harvey Park, just based on the the budget amount matching what the grant amount that we actually received is actually got, was a little bit more than what we originally budgeted. Any questions on Parks and Recreation? Would there be a reimbursement due on the uh, on the bridge itself, or is that going to be an offset to? Park fees or I think it's an offset to Quimby on twelve. Is that what we're doing? Correct. Yes, yeah. yes that's how it will work. Actually with this he's more or less overpaying uh, by building the bridge as opposed to paying the Quimby uh, fees. We're actually getting a nice benefit of having this bridge come in. And he sees that as a benefit because it'll benefit his subdivision. Correct. Transportation, there's a bunch of words up there, but you can see the details in your, <laughs> in your staff report. Are we getting tired? <laughs> so, uh, again, a lot of, of moving monies around. A lot of this is because of the grant funding. We got a lot of grant awards this last year, so it's putting money in the budget for the grant awards or to be consistent with the projects themselves. So the interchange, you know, landscaping project, wanting to make sure the project the completed project budget match, matches what we actually spent. Um, there is one thing I'll probably point out to you, and that's the eight annual pavement rehabilitation program. What we're proposing to do is change. We've got all these projects that we're going to be doing uh, for various the various grant monies for bike pet improvements, et cetera. We're proposing to spend some of those those park those uh, street road rehabilitation funds on the same roads that we're going to be doing those projects. So when you come through and you you restripe or you do some sidewalk improvements, that we're also doing the roadways at the same time. So Gwen and her staff are working on kind of prioritizing and figuring out how that's going to be done. We're also looking at doing a, a more significant crack sealing program next year instead of your typical uh, overlay program. We feel like we need to do a little bit more on just the basic maintenance stuff, so you may see a little bit more of that. Any other comments on that project? There's a lot of money being moved around. Is that accurate, Gwen? Good enough. All right. Any questions on transportation? 
What's our timeline on the Operation Maintenance Center? Well, uh, we have a sort of a use it or lose it, do or die deadline of getting a, uh, we have that's uh, actually a, uh, money that's coming through Caltrans um, and that's about a million dollars and we have to obligate that funding by June 30th, which means you got your environment held down, you've got your right away, <coughs> got your design uh, ready to go so we get construction obligation. But more as important, if not more important, is we also have uh, several million dollars of county transit funds that are also earmarked for that project to make it to make it happen. And so if you start losing sort of the underpinnings, you, you eventually would lose the opportunity. So we're uh, Gwen is uh, working diligently to add that to the list of high priority projects. We actually have an RFP for the design and environmental for the transit upper, transit slash public works maintenance and fueling uh, facility. Uh, proposals are due June 11th, I believe, and so as soon as we hire a consultant, we'll start working on the design and environmental. Uh, the money that we have for construction, we're required to have an approved environmental by June of 2016. The actual design doesn't need to be completed by that date. The June of 2016 to get both in, uh, environmental and design completed by that date is a push. So um, we've been working with Caltrans as to if we can get the environmental done, that construction money is my understood, my understanding is secure. So it will take more, once we hire a consultant, probably more than a year to go through the design and environmental. Then from there, um, there's the evaluation of we have this money for construction, this is how much is the project. One of the things we're looking at is um, in the proposal we've told them, or excuse me, the RFP, we've told them how much money we have for construction and that's basically the site that we need to design. So that's, what, that's where we're at in the process right now. So we're okay as far as the Caltrans grant so far? Correct. We're hustling to not have any problems with it. Thanks, Gwen. This is another project I was unaware of. So where is it located? This is uh, the city previously purchased with TDA trans, uh, transit funding the vacant field that is due south of the existing annex there off of Amador. And um, I said Amador, is that right? Mm -hmm. Elm. Elm, sorry. Elm. Uh, right there by the railroad spur, the city has a little sub courtyard. Fuel yes, station. It's a fire station? Or, oh, yeah. no. oh, okay. It's oh, for our okay. fueling okay. and parks that, and rec. Uh, for that currently, yeah. okay. Well, the, the plan would be uh, the city owns that vacant lot that's to the south and west, uh, would be to basically bulldoze what's there and build a new transit. Um, uh, maintenance facility that would also incorporate fueling, so it would be a, 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 a cost share by the city for its fueling, but to basically give us a new maintenance facility there primarily for transit, but it would also service the rest of the city. Uh, right now, we uh, don't have the ability to put the large bus there that this county just purchased, uh, they, so their fueling offsite would be able to bring it all under one site if it's feasible, if they're environmental. There's money ready to build it. Uh, the capital money is the easy part. So uh, it's making sure we don't lose any entitlements along the way. What, what will uh, what will happen with the Parks and Recs courtyard then? Then be incorporated into, into the that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. The joint use facility. Are you talking about like across there. from BMD? No, it's where the Parks and Recs Corporation yard is now. Right uh, there is the spur. Yeah, yeah. That, that building would be gone. Can you go to the south that you said empty lot? Oh, right. oh and so you brought more. Yeah. You know, we would build a new facility on the expanded acreage that's currently vacant and re, you know, basically reuse the existing area by starting over and making sure that we have a dual use facility when we're done. I didn't realize there was property behind there. Yeah, when did we buy that? It's been two or three years? Before I got here, so over three years ago. I think it was October of 2011 because it's right when I walked in the door. Ah. So it's kind of behind the property behind the existing. It's immediately behind it. The courtyard is approximately 1.3 uh, acres, and we purchased approximately two acres that is immediately behind it. Hmm. So it's between the courtyard and Poplar. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. And you'll actually, as part of the process, uh, we'll always be looking at a <laughs> rezone of that. It's currently residential, so it would be rezoning to public use. 
Any other questions on transportation? Okay. Water. A couple of different items here. We deferred the old town water main improvements because we moved forward with the Meadowview pipeline replacement project. Um, 53G, which is water capacity, that's just to match the current project that we awarded on the Cimarron project to the actual budget, um, and then the addition of Meadowview, and then just close out items for Monterey Bay Well Golden Heights Water Treatment Plant expansion for some additional, for some landscaping associated with that, that new work out there. Any questions on water? Okay. Wastewater? Uh, a couple of these items are just, the, the first one is just incorporating the, the, the small budget into the annual maintenance and operations budget. The NPDES permit is increased in the current year uh, of $161,000 to complete that project. Again, similar to the, the top one, the annual levy reservoir in Paul Nash is going to be money moved to the maintenance and operations incorporated in there as, a, as opposed to a separate capital improvement project. And then um, the waste, the big wastewater treatment plant expansion is just an adjustment in the current year, $15,000 to, ma to match uh, grant funding that we received. Any questions on wastewater? Only other adjustment is $30,000 was miscoded in the budget document that we put together. Fund 9 transportation funding should have been coded to the pedestrian enhancement project, 55G. Instead, it was in 55F Meadowview water, water line, so we're recommending just moving it, that funding to the right project, and we'll make that change and bring that back to the council on June 2nd. So the recommendation is the council receive this, this report, ask any final questions, solicit any public input, provide direction to staff on any other modifications that you would like to see. Happy to answer any questions. Move to receive the report. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Payne. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Hewer. If we don't have any further comments or public comment, call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Payne. Aye. Councilmember Hewer. Aye. Councilmember Campion. Aye. Councilmember Powers. Aye. Mayor Cruz. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Council. You want me to do this? Okay. I've been asked to say today's meeting will air Friday, May 29th at 8 p.m. and Sunday, May 31st at 8 p.m. All right, with that, motion is adjourned. Motion? Meeting.